The stock market is selling off today, and I hate to say it, but the Chicago MNI report might have something to do with it as what's called a leading indicator. And folks, in this video, I want to give you a trajectory that whether this happens or not, I think is really important for you to take the big takeaway out of it and apply it to your life. So we're going to have a big life sort of lesson towards the end of this video. So if there's any video of mine that you're going to watch to the end, I really encourage it be this one because we're going to start with some data that, you know, probably be old in a few weeks. But the rest of the video will be really critical. So when I start out with talking about this M&I report, how bad it is, and we compare it to how good some of the retail sales numbers are and try to reconcile this, or when I say that, we have an amazing new trade going in the courses, and if you want to see what it is, go check it out. I go to meetkevin.com. Coupon expires tomorrow night. It's the first coupon expiration we've had in, I feel like, a month. We're going to have prices going up quite a bit because we're going to be adding content there. So anyway, remember, join that at meetkevin.com. You get lifetime access to all the courses on building your wealth. And with all that said, let's get into the video today. First things first, take a look at this, folks. This is the Chicago Business Barometer. Now, they measure this using the Chicago area, but they see it as sort of a basket that could be a leading indicator for the United States. In fact, they themselves, I mean, maybe they're biased, but they call themselves a key leading indicator of the U.S. economy. Uh, and this is a diffusion report, which basically says when you have a survey at 50, everybody thinks things are the same. When the survey is above 50, people think things are growing. When the survey is under 50, people think things are shrinking. Well, this report was actually sitting in a pretty narrow range for the past four months. And they said that themselves. I'm not creating, you know, a range with technical analysis on their chart. This was their argument. They said for the past four months, we were trading in a tight range of 45.3 to 47.4, which is under 50, but it's, it's consistent in the tight range. This survey is not Q3 data. A lot of the data that we've been getting is Q3, which is when you had a lot of pull forward because of the port strikes that happened on October 1st. Everybody's like, oh crap, let's order, let's build our inventories, let's do everything before October 1st because then the port strikes are going to screw everything up. This report was actually done between October 1st and October 15th. So for the first few days of the port strike, like two or three days, uh, and then the port strike was over, uh, and, and then the next basically two weeks thereafter. We'll take a look at this. This is the report, and what do we have? It drops to 41.6. That's a really big drop. Listen to some of the lines here. Lowest level since May of 2024, a 1.6% or point below the year-to-date average position. The decline was due to four out of five subcomponents falling. Production, falling. New orders, falling. Order backlog, falling. Employment, falling. Only deliveries were rising, but deliveries are often from orders from the prior month anyway. So they lag anyway out of those categories. All of the leading ones are giving you a warning sign. And this is all happening, mind you, at the same time as you're getting sort of this AI pop right now a little bit. I mean, the Nasdaq's down 2%, NVIDIA's down 4%, Microsoft's almost down 6%, Tesla's down, what, 2.5% here. Yikes, losing that 260 is never good. Who knows, maybe it's just a day of a correction, but let's look at this report. Production fell 7.8 points, significantly below the year-to-date average. Uh, and this was due to nearly 40% of respondents reporting lower production, with half of respondents, nearly half of uh, respondents reporting smaller backlogs, and 90% reporting the same or smaller employment. 90%. This means in October, almost everybody's talking layoffs here or, uh, or, or stability, like stable to down, no up. Now, I know we had a volatile ADP report that looked pretty exciting and consumer spend seems to be up and confidence is still up. But you have to kind of think a little bit about how the trajectory of recessions play out. And then let's go, th let's go through that and then let's talk a little bit about life lesson in this. I also want to give you a quick heads up. I'm doing a new video for the house hack bonds because what uh, some investors have asked is that if we do IPO sooner, they have the opportunity to convert sooner. 
So we're gonna move the conversion from the end of 2029 to the end of 2026 uh, as an option. If you've already invested, we'll give you both options. Uh, and uh, what's really cool about this is it, it sort of incentivizes the company to IPO sooner. Now, no guarantees we can IPO at any time. We're not saying, you know, we're definitely gonna IPO at any time. We, we have no idea, it's all market dependent. But um, it'd be kind of cool if we could bring House Act public at some point in the future, and if we could do that sooner, that'd be pretty cool too. So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, the 5% yield and all the upside by investing in House Hack while getting paid a yield from our rents, you know, piggy bank of $60 million of cash flowing real estate, Go to househack.com and learn more about that. This video can't be a solicitation. Go uh, read the disclosures over there at househack.com. Okay, so this is what's really important, and I want you to watch this very carefully. Path to recession. The first thing that happens is consumers become more choosy. Okay, we've heard this already. Companies start discussing value more. Oh, we need to provide more value. Everybody's getting more choosy. Then pricing power wanes. Few companies actually have pricing power. Basically, everybody's PP goes soft. Not good. Pricing power goes away. They're like, damn, we can't really price anymore. So if we do take price, our volume goes down. Peloton's doing well today. I don't think it'll last. They're doing some pretty great, uh, uh, they're doing a lot of cost cutting though, which actually feeds into what we're talking about here. But their trajectory of revenue growth is negative. Of their existing customers, they bump the prices a bit though and then they're cutting costs. So they're doing their best, I'll give them that. But anyway, as pricing power wanes, one of the first things that you start seeing happen is manufacturing and production start constricting. Now think about some companies that have told us about this. Tesla, with the exception of their um, uh, mega pack facility and the semi facility, they're not expanding facility lines for manufacturing more cars. But we've known that for the past few years. What's something new that we don't know about? UPS is starting to constrict their supply chains. They're reducing the shipping lanes that they have because they're starting to see tempered forecast of demand for the holiday season. It's a problem. In Europe, what do you have in Europe? In Europe, you have manufacturers closing. Volkswagen and others, I mean, Europe's near recession. And China, you have straight up bankruptcies for supply chains. So now what you're actually doing is you're starting to constrict supply chains. Now you might think, oh, Kevin, that's gonna be deflation, or, or sorry, that could be inflationary, right? No, because volumes are plummeting way faster than these supply chains are constricting. So think about it like the economy got really fat and bloated and we're like, a, you know, a 600 pound life. And then all of a sudden we lose weight really rapidly. We've got a lot of extra skin, kind of gross. I know the analogy, but like, even if you take or like surgically remove some of that extra skin, some of those supply chains, you still got extra because you've just lost a lot of weight. You just, you're just not filling that package, that 600 pound package up anymore, it's shrinking. So you're starting to see this, manufacturing constraining, supply chains constraining. And while I was on my vacation, I was studying this and I was really looking, I go, oh my gosh, supply chains constricting are actually a deflationary warning, not an inflationary warning, because it's a sign that demand is falling so quickly that they have to cut supply chains. It's scary. Then what happens? Well, then all of a sudden, earnings per share beats are no longer top line driven. Now this is really important because when earnings per share are no longer top line driven, you have to drive it through efficiency. So everybody drives a little bit of AI efficiency uh, or they fire some people. And when they do that, they get a little bit more efficiency. They get a little bit of a boost. Sorry, I had to go close a noisy door. They get a little bit more of a boost, but it's temporary. It doesn't do you much because you, you can only make your workers so much more productive. Hey, workers, use AI. Cool, you're 10, 20% more productive. Now what are you gonna do on the next earning cycle? Uh, well, AI isn't, you know, an order of a magnitude better than it was last year. So maybe you had an 18% efficiency the first time, and the next time you have a 2% efficiency. Like your efficiency gains peter out. So what happens after the efficiency push? Well, you start firing people. I mean, Visa just laid off 1,400 people to you know, consolidate and cost cut. It's kind of like the challenger jobs report we saw this morning. 
Cost cutting, cost cutting, cost cutting. Then job openings plummet. We're now at a level of 1.1 job openings per unemployed person. And a lot of those job openings are probably not real job openings anyway, because people sort of just leave them open on Indeed or, or whatever, uh, you know, the LinkedIn, whatever, recruiting pages. And you kind of have a misleading look at job openings. And once these job openings fall and the labor market really turns, it's really hard to stop the fall, which the Fed has told us about before. Then all it takes is losing a prop of your economy. That could be the housing market in 2008. It's not this time. Uh, how, there's way too much equity in homes. Uh, there's, there, it was, with the exception of like Florida and Texas, where you're starting to see some short sales, actually could be an opportunity for house hack to buy the dip in some of those areas eventually. But uh, we invested in areas where prices are higher now than they were in the last two to three years, even last year, uh, our, our, you know, where we've invested property values have gone up. But that's, you know, because we're on the ground. We do the research. That's, that's house hack. Like, I'm a real estate guy. <laughs> if you want to learn all about my systems and everything, remember me, Kevin.com. I teach you what we do and how you could do it too. Pretty low cost if you think about it. You get one wedge deal and it makes you a hundred grand. And you spent, you know, 400 bucks or whatever, 500 bucks on a course, like, that's a good deal. <laughs> but anyway, uh, then what happens is the prop of the economy somehow falls. Uh, so what you end up with here is you end up with potentially AI popping. Okay, well, this is not good. Now, we've been talking about that potential for a while. But now it's starting. How is it starting? It's starting because you're seeing a slight miss on guidance from Microsoft and AMD. Now, I'm not saying that's fair. I love the cash flow generation at AMD. I love how much money Microsoft makes as mostly a service business. These are amazing businesses. NVIDIA is a great company. Uh, Apple is a great company. These are all amazing. Tesla is a great company. The problem is the valuations are broken. And so all it takes when you have high valuations is a slight miss, boom, stocks down. If stocks go down, what do you end up with with stocks down? Well, then you get people that start fleeing big names. When people start fleeing big names, they end up going to smaller, riskier companies like Root or Peloton, whatever. They often end up in money losing companies and low cash flow companies. They stay away from value. I personally, in these sort of markets, like companies with high cash flow yields as a percentage of their market cap. This morning in my uh, course member live stream, you know, I think we've had over 1,500 people already watch it, maybe 2,000 at this point. Uh, we, we talked about a company that has an over 8.8% free cash flow yield that's trading for 13 times earnings and a peg ratio of uh, like less than 0.6. It's amazing, in my opinion. Uh, and, and I think there's an opportunity. Like, those are the things that I think are better in this sort of situation. But people sort of flee the bigger names. As they do that, companies get more, more pressure to lay off. UPS tempers expectations. Wells Fargo warns of a scary Christmas. Visa lays off. That's just the start. People don't want to feel bad, though. So they spend their last breath while the economy is still somewhat at highs. Stock markets are still somewhat at highs. They spend their last bits of savings, so to speak, because they got to keep impressions up. They want to feel good about the economy. They want to feel good about themselves. So they blow some more money going into the holiday season. What do you think that hangers, hangover is going to feel like in January? Then you get volumes that continue to plummet at Starbucks and start plummeting at Walmart, Amazon. Companies then spend less on CapEx because stocks have gone down. Look at the cost of artificial intelligence chips like the H100s. Rentals for these per hour? plummeting too much of them and when the value of these per hour goes down the value of the actual underlying chips is going to go down which creates balance sheet risk for these companies which creates potential write down risk for these companies which just contributes to the potential pain that the company stocks end up experiencing stocks end up falling more as the efficiency growth you know hits basically diminishing returns top line falls now, you end up with more layoffs. So really, when people are so worried about like the jobs reports coming in with dirty numbers, you have to go through this whole cycle first, and then you confirm a recession when, job cycle, uh, when, when layoffs get bad. Usually, 
When the yield curve is inverted 50 to 90 basis points, that's when you're at a recession. We're only at 12 right now, so we got a ways to go. So what's the life lesson of this? Folks, please, 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 I beg of you, prepare for one thing, okay? Prepare for massive wage deflation. Please, I beg of you. Look, I run a real estate company. It's House Hack. You can invest in a house hack home. You know I've got courses on building your wealth at mekevin.com. But I'm also a financial advisor. That's at stockhack.com. And the people that we're talking to, we are analyzing their tax returns, their tax situations, their business structures, their, their entity structures, what they're doing to maximize their chance of getting through the next recession, whether there is one or not. Because guess what? If there's not a recession, you just made yourself stronger. If there is a recession, you enabled yourself to survive. You can book an intro call if you want over at stockhack.com. But anyway, prepare for massive wage deflation, not just because of a softening economic cycle, but also because of AI. It is going to cause wage deflation. People are used to wages going up all the time. The opposite is going to happen. People are going to start bidding against each other to get wages down. It's scary. That's my take. So prepare. Do what you can. Save. Minimize your risk. Diversify your investments. Uh, evaluate paying down debt. Maybe look at the stock market, still mostly at all-time highs. And, and maybe be a little cautious. I mean, look at this. The Qs hit 500. We hit an all-time, a near all-time high over here, 501.35. We were at 502 in July. Okay. It's rich right now. NVIDIA is near all-time highs, Palantir, Tesla, whatever. Just buckle up. That's all. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope this is helpful for you. Check out househack.com, meetkevin.com, and stockhack.com. See you all in the next one. Thanks so much. Remember that coupon expires tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. You get to see that trade I'm working. Thanks, bye. Why do not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take.